what advice do you give a guy who comes in your practice? Maybe you don't see a lot of these guys, but let's let's say you get a guy um, who comes in and says, "Hey, look, I I want to I want to bank my sperm. I want to freeze my sperm." Now, presumably, you'll get a lot of that if a guy's undergoing therapy for sure. cancer or something like that. Um, is there anything a guy needs to know? And would you recommend a guy do that if he's forty? doesn't have a partner, but says, look, I want to have kids. And is, isn't there something to the idea that my sperm are better today than they will be in a decade? It's a huge issue. Paternal age, yeah. paternal age and fertility, paternal age. So we can, we can go there, but yeah. I don't place value judgments. I say, good idea. Uh, I am a disclosure. I'm on a, you know, a board of legacy. Uh, I was, I love their mission driven the way they're mission driven. And so I, I like the fact they're going for military and exposed patients and this and that and VA. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm for that. I think it's the lowest hanging fruit in the field, especially obviously for chemo, for cancer survivors and things like, I don't care what you think might happen with your cancer. I would still bank it. I started a nonprofit called Banking on the Future. 16 year olds to 21 year olds with cancer, we'll do it for you, we'll pay for it for five years just give us a sample yep. because it's so much harder afterwards and, or not, right? So so you would advise any male that's that hasn't reproduced and who might want to, who's undergoing any chemotherapy for any cancer, just play it safe, bank. For cancer, yes. Yep. Now, should anyone do it for any reason? Probably not. But again, I don't pass the judgment. If yep. they're worried about something, then I'm worried, then, then they should. Yep. What now, paternal not, age do you worry about? So good question. Uh, and you look at like national guidelines for sperm donation, 40 is considered older paternal age, 50 for sure, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at risks to offspring, miscarriages, stillborns, um, autism, birth defects, things immediately related to conception, prematurity, those go up with paternal age. Then you look at birth defects when they're born, those go up, with, you know, one to twofold. And then the worrisome ones are the single gene defects and the epigenetics like psychiatric morbidity. So the autism, schizophrenia, dyslexia, bipolar disorder, potentially Alzheimer's in offspring. Yep. And they're not detectable with young. So big issues. So I've written a lot about that, published on it. I was actually having my second child at 50 when I was writing this thing, should I be doing this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> writing a paper on all these risks called and with Alan Dichenko from University of Pittsburgh. But I think it's a hockey stick curve for risk to offspring. And you think the 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 inflection is 40 or 50? I think it's more like 60. Okay. I think there's a slow linear increase in risk to offspring from 25 to 50 or 60. And then there's an inflection and then there's the blade of the stick. And I think that's logarithmic. Same curve as women but with they're chromosomal. Shifted, yeah, but they're shifted 20 years earlier or something yeah, like so that. Yeah, so it's a shorter curve, but the same thing, 40, 38 to 40, it's kind of a point where things really ramp up with yep. chromosomes. The men's stuff is not chromosomal. So yep. if you take the curves together, they're different spans, same shape, but I think the female curve is on top of the male curve. This is not a the same relevant relative risk, right? So women, you know, you go from... 25 to 40, your your chance of a, a miscarriage, though so it's chromosomal, it goes up quite significantly after that, very significantly. And the and the, the consequence of women's issues with offspring related health is basically miscarriage. Yeah, and in many ways it's almost easier to detect, right? Because very so so it's it's, it's more, it, it, can, it can be more dramatic, but it usually and is, now prevented with yep. with pre implantation genetic testing. Yeah. Men are different. You can't detect these things. They're yeah. single gene mutations. This is the med the machinery is constantly working. It's getting old. The quality control of the process goes down, and little gene mutations get in there that are always being always being spun off in the heat of the engine, and they're getting they're not getting vetted, so the machinery is not doing a good job. So they're getting through, and they're not going to be they're not going to be lethal. They're going to be deleterious. So that's where you get things, and autism's a classic one, paternal age related. Um, looks like that's the biggest risk factor for it, and that worries me a lot, right? So I think um, it's interesting. It's, the facts are that human evolution is entirely driven by sperm. Yeah. 
because eggs are just sitting there correcting the problem. It's entirely driven by sperm. And half, and so 50 mutations a year, a, a generation usually gets spit out, at least in a nature paper, um, probably between generations. And it, there's always mutations occurring in 14-year-old fathers, but it goes way up with 60-year-old fathers. So the rate of mutations goes way up with age, but it averages 50 over a reproductive life. And most of them, half of the mutations that we are throwing off as a species are not ears or hands or feet or height or things. It's all neurodevelopmental. It's like half neurodevelopmental. Yeah. So when you think about what we're seeing, you know, the Martians from the 50s and the movies with big heads, yeah, yeah. that's kind of where we're headed. It's autism, dyslexia, bipolar disorder. You know, these are neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative issues. And why is that? Well, that's what's going on. I mean, that's where we're being stimulated. That's where we're being asked to evolve. Look at the last 30 years, right? Funny. One of the biggest investors in uh, Salesforce um, said to me, I was, said to me, I, you know, I realized I was dyslexic when I, when my son was born. And I said, really? He said, yeah, but you know what? It helped me be the man I am to realize that Salesforce is going to fly. I gave him the first 500,000, gave him the first million. They never took any more money. And he said, it let me focus. I was, so autism is one of those diseases where you put out, you, you ignore a lot of input and you find the, the gift and it's amazing. If you go down the rabbit hole of what they're good at, it's like their whole brain trust is there. So is that a disease or is that where we're headed? I mean, I think it exists on a spectrum. I, I think any, anyone who's, who's probably spent time with kids, you know, using ASD as a, um, as, as an example, boy, you know, you know, mild versions of it, the way it can be defined, because it really has three categories now right. in the DSM-5. Um, I think the mildest version probably comes with more superpowers than limitations yeah. or maybe equal amount, but but clearly the more severe it gets, uh, it's pretty debilitating. But but this this idea but that's of paternal what age- We're calling it disease though. Yeah. But maybe it's not disease. Maybe it's where we're headed. Maybe it's the future. Maybe the non sequiturs that come out of those brains. I mean, look at who's changing the world right now, at least in Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah. But but again, I would argue most of those people would be in category, you know, Mild, class yeah. one, not right. class three. Um, what's the, uh, anyway, what's, the, thaw, what's the thaw success rate, right? So if a guy is 40, he's he goes ahead, he freezes and banks his sperm, assuming they were good to go in, right. are they very high probability of thawing correctly? So when you freeze sperm, it's about mm, a 200-year-old process, re regularly used for about 75. I forgot who the Italian scientist was who f uh, froze sperm in snow and then thawed it, and it, it, it was alive a couple hundred years later. After Leeuwenhoek came up with the microscope, they found it was moving, hmm. and it was possible. So egg thawing is very new. Right? Egg freezing and thawing is very new. This is very old. So everyone is thinking about sperm now because eggs are being frozen left and right. But this is much older technology and the cell is much hardier than an egg. So it does a lot better typically. When you freeze it, it's the freezing process that kills sperm before icicles on the inside. Yes. And then while it's frozen, there's usually no issue. No issue. And then, it's, and then there's another problem when you thaw it, rapid temperature shifts. So that's where the kill rate comes from. In a good sample, half of it should survive. Okay. And so, in, in so how much sperm would you tell a guy to bank if he has to do it, if it's the definitive samples for his life? So meaning he's 40 or he's about to undergo chemotherapy or some other exposure where he should just assume he will not have normal sperm again. What, what do you tell him? So I usually say, depending on what technology you're going to use, but if your sperm counts normal, Three, three ejaculates is one kid's worth of sperm with insemination technology where you would thaw it and then, and then turkey baste it. So 10 ejaculates for three shots on goal for three kids, potentially. For three kids with low technology, but 10 ejaculates will give you most of China with IVF. Got it. Oh, right? when you say low technology, you mean IUI or something right, like so that. Right, so there's three levels, sex, no tech, yep. high tech is IVF, and then the middle is IUI. Yep. That's okay. the stuff that's turkey basting. It's relatively straightforward, yep, relatively yep. cheap. I see. Three kids for that, but plenty of sperm for IVF. So three ejaculates would kid. be more than enough. If they're normal. For IVF. Yeah. So the po population you're talking about are maybe cancer survivors. Half of those will not be normal. They're really looking at IVF. Yep. So they don't need that many. Yep. But I'd Got say it. three is a good number, but it's an insurance policy. Yeah. Right? I'm Peter Atia. 
This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights. You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future. Thank you.